So Sajid Javid, you will have heard about his his mighty 300 person party. Uh, he told us yesterday that you should take a lateral flow test before going to a Christmas party uh, of about two, two to three hundred people. Uh, but this morning, the business minister, George Freeman, told us that his department is not having a Christmas party. Would you go to a party? Are you more George Freeman than Sajid Javid? Well, I think that testing is absolutely critical to this. That's that's one of the big advantages this year compared to last year. You know, it's a year to the day since the vaccine was uh, approved and the rollout was mm. then a week later. And uh, it's a great anniversary. But as well as the vaccine, we've just got testing available f- freely to everybody now. So I do think that, that testing, take a test before you go to uh, something, um, you know, that is the... Uh, that is one of the big tools we've got, and it's the one of the ways through this. Mm. The problem is, though, if you if you are going to party with three hundred people, you you're not going to know them all. You don't know whether they've all tested. So there has to be a degree of common sense, surely. Yeah, and personal responsibility. I mean, one of the things that we we tried to stress as much as possible throughout this, and um, one of the things I tried to stress when I was in in the hot seat was the importance of personal responsibility in tackling this. You know, it, it's everybody's, everybody's got a role to play. And in fact, actually, I think reflecting on it, there has been a huge amount of that. Uh, it is harder to communicate, mm. uh, but it is, it, it's it's actually something that the whole country has been involved in thinking, what are these, these judgments? Mm. But thankfully now we have more tools in our armoury. The other tool in our armoury, of course, is masks, which have become um, mandatory, uh, in, in England, uh, there are different rules, obviously, that apply in the rest of the UK. In England, um, in shops, hairdressers and on public transport. We just spoke to Professor Trish Greenhouse from Oxford University. I'm sure you're aware of her about the evidence on masks and she was unequivocal. They work. Um, I know you're a big fan of masks as well. Um, do you think it's a problem when some of your colleagues still still don't wear them in the House of Commons? Uh, I think that masks, uh, they are one of the tools that we've got but compared to the you know the big scientific advances like obviously the vaccine the antiviral treatments um the the testing um masks are uh, are then in the sort of next layer of Im- importance of things so i'm glad that the um that the government i think it br- basically got the the response broadly right it's always a balance on these things especially with the new variant and the uncertainty about the impact of that that we're all talking about and we know that it'll be a couple of weeks until we get the first the first lab results it'll be longer till we get the first real world evidence of the impact of omicron i think they got the balance broadly right but it is a balance and of course there'll be voices saying they should have gone further there's some voices saying they shouldn't go as far uh, and uh, you know i know what it feels like to have to make those judgments mm. but what about the messaging of it when you have new laws that have just come in saying, right, we're all going back to masks, and then you look at the House of Commons and, and they're not. OK, they're not in a shop, they're not on public transport. That's right, it's a there's a lot of, But there is a lot of them. They don't all know each other. They don't necessarily know that they've all, had, they've all taken a test that morning. Do you think it would make the messaging clearer if they all did? Well, th- you can always argue that the rules should be tighter. In this case, you know, the House of Commons is a workplace and you're effectively arguing that uh, the workplace rules should be uh, should be tighter, um, uh, but I think that you've got to strike a balance, and I think the government basically got that right. Mm, okay, um, we spoke to Sajid Javid yesterday about the uh, booster campaign. Yeah. Um, and of course, there is a target now. They want all adults to be offered a, a vaccine yeah. by the end of January. Yeah. Um, do you see um, an enthusiasm gap? Because when it came to the vaccine, this was a new thing. It was our way out of lockdown. It meant that we could do things like go on holiday, perhaps yeah. get into a venue or so. It's different this time around because there isn't that there isn't that push. There isn't that motivation for a lot of people. Oh, I know um... I know friends who've said they're not going to bother getting it because they already feel protected enough by a double dose. Yeah, I, I don't really buy that. I think that you know the UK has had this incredible take up. And ninety percent take up of the of the first jab, eighty percent so far of the second, and the booster take up is is very high in the in those in the most vulnerable populations, older people who've had access uh, for the lo- for the longest. Mm. And if you look internationally, our take up is is really high, which is a which is a very good thing. Now, um, uh, do th- there isn't the same excitement as the ones last year. 
Um, but that's because it's the third time round, and mm. the third time you do anything, it's less of a, uh, of a novelty. And the marginal improvement that you get, you know, it, obviously the first one is the most uh, critical, but actually the, with the new variant, all three are critical because the booster gives you a broader protection as well, especially if you had AstraZeneca Oxford jab first time around and get the Pfizer jab second time around, like I'll be getting on Sunday. Mm. Um, the Prime Minister's getting his today. I know he's pretty excited about that. So, so uh, you know, we've, we, the message is clear. We've all got to get out there and get boosted. But I think also, you know, the approach we've taken here to maximising the uptake uh, by ha- making this a positive cheerful campaign has been has has been pretty effective mm. um i just want to reflect a little bit on on the kind of all the that hard work that you did you know you were never off this program you were on the media rounds all the time you know you were you were really working all the hours that god sends um and then you have someone like um dominic cummings saying actually um you were incompetent you were you were useless you know you really went to town on you um how did it feel Hear, hearing someone say that about you? Well, you know, the thing is that uh, there's a reason Dom Cummings left government and the government then operated much, much better. And so, uh, I, yeah, I was caring about the substance. Obviously, you don't like getting these sort of personal, this sort of personal abuse. But I think the good thing, uh, uh, reflecting on that whole episode, is that uh, is the, the public saw straight through it and, and saw it for what it was. Uh, and so I was able just to concentrate on, 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 uh, on delivering, and getting on with the job. And then you know that all happened around a select committee report, which came out and uh, and clearly said that uh, well, they clearly saw through it all as well. Yeah. So you know, but you go uh, into when you're in politics, you don't expect to be uh, uncriticised. You know, you're making tough decisions, and and um, and, and and rightly in a democracy, there's a big debate about it. Mm. So. That's uh, that's that's all part and parcel of it. Uh, just uh, finally, before we move on, um, we've had quite a bit of um, uh, interaction, texts and tweets, etc., from people saying, you know, why are you speaking to Matt Hancock? This is someone who imposed very draconian rules on us and then disobeyed them himself. So let me just ask you, um, obviously you left government after CCTV footage was leaked of you breaking social distancing guidelines with an aid. Um, how much do you regret that in terms of the public health message yeah. damage that it might have done? Well, uh, of course, I, uh, I regret my actions and, you know, I've, I'm, uh, and I've apologised for, the, for them, for the, and, and, you know, for, the, uh, for people I let down. Um, and I think that, um, I, you know, and as I, I resigned, ultimately. Um, I resigned because of that... Uh, failure of leadership um, and um, I think that you know of course so of course I I, I, uh, I regret uh, that and I'm I'm sorry about it so I understand why people feel like that all I'd say is that um, there's a you know you've got to look at I hope people will look at the the record in in the round uh, in fighting the pandemic and making sure we're much better prepared now than we were when it first struck the issue of trust in, in, in government is a critical one. We might mention the stories about Boris Johnson and parties in number 10 Downing Street. The other issue that, that's raised in connection with you, Matt Hancock, you'll be familiar with it, it was raised in Parliament yesterday. You spoke about it again, so I think it'd be worth exploring it with you. There's this issue that the publican in your constituency became famous for getting a government contract for medical equipment. There isn't in existence an NHS contract with another company that specifies his company, your landlord's company, as a subcontractor. So your landlord with no medical equipment history, is in a contract to supply medical equipment to the health service of which you're the democratically elected head. To lots of people, that's simply a case of cronyism. There's no way out of it. What do you say to it? Well, there's two levels on which to answer this question. Um, The first is on the the details. Um, This gentleman, you just called him my landlord. He wasn't my landlord. He was a constituent. Um, He not only ran a... Uh, you had a pub. picture of his pub on the wall, though. He was, well, he was I open, connected to you. I'm, I'm a local MP. I open, you know, when, when pubs go and invite you to open them, then you go and open them. So I was his local MP, so he was a constituent. Um, and is a constituent. And um, also had a company that supplied um, uh, plastic tubing and those tubes that you get when you do a test. Now, 
completely separately from me, he got a contract with another company. It wasn't with the government. It wasn't with the NHS. Um, and that company, in turn, got a contract completely separate from me with the, uh, in order to supply, uh, to, to do tests. The, so I didn't have anything to do with the contract. And There's no recommendations. At no point you recommended to anyone. In no, your and in fact, I know this to be the case, both because I was there, but also because all of the documentation around this has been FOI'd and, pub- and published, and given to the newspapers, um, and it, there is no uh, smoking gun. In fact, I've, I, I'm, you know, I'm very clear that what we did was about saving lives. And this is the bigger picture way of answering this question, which is, you know... Everything that people in government were doing at that time was about saving lives. And it was about getting hold of the equipment we needed, whether in this case on testing or on PPE or on ventilators. And we got that from wherever we could. Um, And it was all done properly through the civil service. And the National Audit Office have already been through all this. And then there'll be a public inquiry. I've handed over all of my communications to this uh, in, in advance of the public inquiry happening. And in a way, for me, transparency is the best way through this because... You know, there there simply was uh, a a huge, huge effort in those very difficult circumstances early in the pandemic uh, to save lives. And, you know, so I get insinuations and and, and Twitter storms about this. But honestly, it's rubbish. Um, Transparency is the is the key point that that you're making there. Um, The 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 other uh, story that's going around today and and yesterday about parties at Number Ten Downing Street, two events. I'm I'm presuming you weren't at either one of these. There's an event in. in No, I'm. I can't help you on this one. I I wasn't invited, so I don't know anything about it. But does it matter? Do you think it's a problem for messaging if people were told this is a Christmas? You were in. You're in charge here. You know how strict the rules were. You were responsible for those rules. If you're at work. You go to work, you come home again, you don't have any socialising, you don't have parties, you don't do these things. The, the, the Prime Minister's spokesman says, we believe we followed the rules and then shuts it down entirely. Is that being transparent? Is it not right to say, here is what we did and allow people to judge it? Because if, in your view, people were gathering after work during that really big lockdown over Christmas and having social events, that is wrong, isn't it? And it, and it, and it sends a message, so we were talking about earlier, one rule for us and another rule for them. No, I, I, I've, I've absolutely no idea about it. Um, I, I wasn't, um, I, I wasn't invited. I wasn't there. Um, and the prime minister has been very clear about this at the dispatch box in the House of Commons when he was asked about it yesterday. So in a way, you know, you, you, you asked for transparency, and it, this was debated at the prime minister's questions, and the prime minister was very clear that no rules were broken. Just two last questions, my handcuff. That's okay. Firstly, on, on your legacy, and then on, on your future. Legacy, what do you think people will remember of your time as, as Health Secretary? Well, I think that the early stages when there was so much uncertainty, you know, none of us knew what was in store. Um, you know, in that period, we had to try to communicate as best we knew what the, what the best response was in this world of, of very little information. Um, and... People come up to me and tell me their lockdown stories all the time and, you know, how they felt at that moment. And then I suppose the second part is is the vaccine, which I obviously played a major role in, along with some other amazing people um, like uh, Kate Bingham and uh, uh, and the Oxford team. Um, and the the, um, you know, and that that was the that's the route out. So th- those are the things that people talk to me about. And um, and I'm very proud to have played my part in those, uh, and uh, and and what we've done is we've um, we've all learned, and you know in politics it's often quite hard to say I don't know, and it's quite hard to say you know I've learned something new and we've changed our approach because we've you know we've learned something, um, but those are things we had to get really used to saying, uh, and 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 um, and and I hope people have seen that I've just tried to I tried to deal with. The, the problems that we had as best I possibly could as they as I faced them. And will you be going, will you be forgiven, do you think, by people? And will you be welcome back to government? Well, the, will the, you publish a book? The, uh, the public, I'm, uh, look, I'm not, I'm not in any rush. I'm enjoying life on the back benches. And actually, I think there's a big contribution that people who've been in office should make in the House of Commons from the back benches. I think it's important and it's helpful. Uh, I admire the way that Theresa May, for instance, as former Prime Minister, is... Uh, still there asking the government the 
pointed and sometimes difficult questions from the backbenchers, having seen it herself. Um, and so I think that is a, a, an important role in our in our democracy. Um, and uh, and and I'm enjoying myself. Is there a book deal? I haven't got a book deal. Uh, I don't know where that story uh, came from. Um, but you know, I'm going to have to um, answer all the questions that an inquiry brings at some point. And I think that's right. So that as a country, we can we can learn how best to deal with these things because pandemics as a problem aren't going away, sadly. <laughs>